Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Globalnet21, and this is one of the regular webinars we do. And this is going to be a webinar interview, maximum of an hour, but it may be a little less than that. Um, what we're going to do in this webinar is look at what is called big data. And some people may wonder what big data is, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're going to look at, really, is how big data affects particular groups, and particularly marginalized groups in society, and uh, whether they, that, that's done in a positive or a negative way. And we've got with us today Lena Dimchek, who you can see here at the moment. And she is an academic from uh, uh, a university in, in the United Kingdom. I think it's Cardiff, isn't it? And um, she uh, also founded an organization called the Data Justice Lab, which tackles some of the problems and issues that we're going to talk about in this webinar. And, and you'll find out about that in a minute. We also got Terry Lone with us, who's going to help with the questions, and you can see him here now. Now, if you have any questions, please typing it, typing up in, in, in the chat box on the webinar. Um, system, which you can see on the right hand side, and Peter Felton is already here and he's typed things up. And if you're watching on Facebook, then type into the Facebook comments common, uh, column, and that is um, on several Facebook groups. We're on Globalnet 21, we're on Info Voices, we're on a number of different groups. So please type your comments in there and we'll try and pick up some of them. Anyhow, Lena, thank you um, for joining us. And what I'd like to start asking you with is we talk about big data and we talk about it glibly like we assume everyone knows what big data is, but it's only something that's gone into a sort of common currency in the last few years. And people will wonder, well, yeah, data, fine, but what is big data? I mean, why do people make a fuss? Why are they talking about it? Could you just explain to us the significance of big data? Sure. Um, so big data is um, a development we've seen in recent years that's closely linked to the nature of our digital technologies, where um, many times now when we engage uh, with or use digital technologies, we leave behind what can be thought of as sort of traces that can be uh, collected uh, en masse. Um, and what big data refers to is the sort of mass collection of lots of different types of data, data points that are left behind when we engage in digital environments, so our preferences, our likes, our connections, our relations, and so forth, um, that need to be um, processed through computation of some form or another. So big data really is uh, very link closely linked to also computation, that you need, to, you need that in order to process this amount of data. Um, in different ways. And um, why does it concern people so much? Um, I think it, it concerns people uh, for different reasons. One is that I think um, it concerns people because um, it has highlighted the extent to which what we do online is monitored and tracked and can be collected um, and analyzed. Um, so it means that, for example, we can be profiled through what we do online uh, by analyzing uh, this data, by trying to identify certain patterns of behavior and then try and predict what you might do in the future. And I think some people find that quite intrusive that this is uh, not what they thought their digital environments were like, that, that what they did online was not going to be uh, used to make decisions about them or profile them in different ways. So I think the question around uh, privacy and, and how it might feel invasive um, is, is one reason. But the other reason that it's starting to concern people is that it's used more and more for uh, decision making. So it's used uh, a lot by lots of different actors, both uh, companies, but also governments to inform, to recognize, to use, collect lots of data, try and identify certain patterns of behavior and traits in different people in order also to make decisions about people differently. So, um, and I think that some people feel that actually it is not possible or data will always be too limited to really capture who we are. So therefore using that to make decisions about us is quite problematic. Okay, so before I come to Terry, um, I mean, for what you said, clearly big data has an impact on government. We have some people here, here today from local areas watching, so they'd be interested, for example, whether it impacts on the politics of local government as well as central government. Do you see it doing that? 
Uh, yes, very much. So I have actually just uh, been working on a project that looks precisely at, at local government and how councils and local authorities are also turning to what we can term sort of data-driven technologies or the use of data analytics in order to change how they provide public services. So we're seeing it in, in different ways. So what's happening at one level more and more is the creation of what's referred to as data warehouses, which is the sharing of data between different parts of a local authority or different parts of the council in order to integrate data sets, different data sets from you know, whether that's social services, uh, policing, education, etc., to create a kind of uh, what they describe as sort of a single view or a golden view of the citizen uh, in order to get a sense of any kind of interaction that anyone within a, a local authority has had um, with public services. Um, but then what they're also increasingly doing is trying to use this uh, data to also predict uh, who might be vulnerable and therefore how they might act on that, or who might be a risk in terms of, say, for example, crime or criminality, right? So, um, so this is happening uh, more and more across uh, local government, in part in response to, to austerity and cuts, um, so trying to find alternative ways to, uh, ident you know, to focus resources or use resources differently within uh, local authority or local government. Okay, I mean, that sounds like another webinar that I'd love to do because I think people in local government will be really, really interested in this because I doubt uh, many of them have given really serious thought because this is a, a new big issue. But anyhow, Terry, over to you for your question, but I'll unmute you first. Uh, thanks, Francis. Uh, Lena, you said a few minutes ago you talked about the possibility of data being too limited to capture who we are. And I'd just like to ask you what your thoughts are on an, an expression that I've read a bit recently, which is the, the conflation of data and reality. In other words, is there a danger that because of our ability to gather ever more data, which you've just talked about, that because of that, it leads to a sort of unexamined assumption that everything that's important in the world can be expressed in terms of quantifiable measurement. Sorry, that was rather a long question, but if you could uh, just say something about this problem of people assuming that everything uh, that's important can be expressed in data, that would be nice. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that this is definitely one of the key sort of discussion points in, in this from a sort of um, social justice angle or, or democracy angle is that um, data or understanding the world through data is also a particular form of social knowledge because data can only really capture what can be measured, right? So we talk about quantification right, in that sense. And there is a lot of discussion about the fact that we have infinitely complex social relations, we have infinitely complex identities, and not all of that can be measured uh, or turned into data points that can be um, collected. And often what we find when we have had um, if you like, uh, struggles or people have felt uh, harmed by uh, data, it has often been because their identities or their lives haven't been captured appropriately by data systems. So decisions about them have been made on the basis of an analysis that actually doesn't match their lives. So I think that this um, idea that, you know, there is a, a a straightforward relationship between people and data is one of the key areas of where we see concerns with data emerge. Okay, but when we talk about um, big data, you know, we're worried about it, but there are some positive things about it, isn't there? I mean, Alex Pentman in his book, Social Physics, which I'm sure you've read, um, you know, talks about the fact that social change is about the generation and the exchange of ideas. That's the engine behind it. It's the atoms within the data system. And he says that very often, big data can make public bodies like local authorities, like government, make better decisions because you can find out what people want in a locality better than an election, better than an opinion poll, better than a referendum. You, also, you get a sense of what they want in qualitative terms, but because of sentiment analysis, you can find how strongly they feel. So your services can reflect much better what people want if you didn't have big data. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, there, are, in some to some extent, of course, uh, that is uh, that is the case in the sense that um, what data uh, and collecting data can do is throw light at things that perhaps we didn't weren't aware of before, for example, and we can get all of a sudden we can start understanding. Um, particular, you know, uh, features of our society that we perhaps didn't understand uh, particularly well before. But I do think that we shouldn't at the moment, I mean, we really should uh, have a, a realistic understanding of what these technologies can do. So you mentioned something like sentiment analysis, for example. I mean, sentiment analysis, even by local government and so forth, it's, it's far too unsophisticated a technology as, as that we have at the moment to do anything particularly useful. I mean, corporations use it for you know, trying to get a sense of, of sentiments around their brands and so forth. But the idea that we have sophisticated enough sentiment analysis to make decisions off the back of that, that's where it starts, I think, uh, to become a little bit dangerous. Oh, okay, um, Terry, over to you. Um, I'd like to ask about um, power imbalance, because you've already implied that part of the value the perceived value of big data is just that, that it's big, that it gets together a whole lot of metrics about lots and lots of people. So obviously anybody who has got access to that big data is, uh, is in a position of considerable power. And I wonder, and people have mentioned the idea of data colonialism here as, as being a, a, a suitable metaphor, but I wonder if it's possible to imagine a situation in which individuals own their data in a way that somehow stops it being harvested by those with power. Yeah, um, so this is a key, I think, a key discussion point, particularly within Europe, where uh, there are moves towards trying to push back on what is seen as predominantly US-based companies that own uh, most of this data. Um, and whether we can sort of rebalance that from an ownership point of view. The problem around framing that as uh, individual ownership over data is quite problematic, problematic because data has mainly has value through its relational features, right? So the idea that I own my own data and I can sort of have a portable set of data points about me that I can then uh, sell if I want to and so forth, isn't actually where the value of data really lies. It lies in its relation and it lies in how those, um, those data points relate to the features of many others. Um, so I think the idea of individual data ownership is problematic, but where we do have some emergencies around the idea of sort of collective or community based ownership of data where you sort of, you know, which is something that's happening in places like Barcelona, for example, where there is a strong movement towards trying to move towards what they describe as technological sovereignty. So it's very much the idea that we should own in the city the infrastructure and the data that's collected about people and that should be publicly owned in order to also then feedback whatever value we can draw from that to the people of Barcelona, to the people of that city. And there, there, I think there are some interesting things happening um, to try and re rebalance what is at the moment, of course, an incredibly uh, asymmetry of power between those who are able to collect data on us and use that to analyze us versus those who are subject to those types of profiles and, and analysis who often have no idea how they're being profiled or why. I wonder if it's possible for you to say um, a little bit more about what's uh happening in Barcelona and what people feel about that. Because without being unduly cynical, it seems to me that sometimes people feel just as alienated from their local um, democratically elected council as they do from a huge uh, multinational corporation. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily a data question, of course, that could be, that's to do with lots of uh, other things. But um, uh, that might be the case. I still think that, um, I guess that's to do with whether you feel decision making and, and being part of decision making is more has higher possibility within a, a local community or within a city than it does uh, on a sort of global scale or certainly in relation to a corporation. Um, and I would have thought that, I mean, you might know this better than I, whether I've, my instinct is that in Barcelona, at least, there is a feeling that that's um, at city level, perhaps there are more possibilities to actually be part of decision making. The, I mean, the, the Barcelona experiment, you know, it's a bit like uh, 
you know, if you talk about Spain, I can think of the Mondragon um, Cooperative in Spain, which, you know, challenges corporations, but it's very small compared with the large corporations. And, you know, how can you really create an alternative to the control of big data when you have companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, you have countries like Russia and China who are using big government to control big data. The, the, the sort of um, the things are stacked up against us, aren't they? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think of course, it, this is a huge challenge and I wouldn't say that it takes just uh, one solution and I'm not, I'm not going to sit and pretend that I have some roadmap for, for a solution for this, but I do think, uh, you know, um, I think it has to come from different angles. So for example, uh, within Europe, I think there is um, at least a desire at the moment to try and, and break up some of the power that these monopolies have and, and push back on this monopoly status, perhaps by looking at precisely the, 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 you know, the idea that should we have public ownership of data or who should actually be allowed to own this data. There's also a move towards trying to think of these uh, of data as a form of public infrastructure um, and therefore needs to be regulated differently than it, than it is now. So of course there are, there are lots of different regulatory frameworks that could be applied to this um, and it will, it will be more, it'll have to, it'll necessarily take more than just one thing. But I think as a, you know, and I agree that Barcelona, what's happening in Barcelona is very small scale and perhaps isn't necessarily very sustainable, but what I think that they have been successful in is to create a narrative that tries to challenge and get us to imagine how things might be different. And of course, that's a necessary first step because one of the things that I found in my research, a massive challenge that we have, is that a lot of people feel very disempowered in terms of the nature of our digital environments and feel very resigned to the way that they are and feel that they can't do much about it. And of course, the first challenge is to get us to think differently about that and to sort of reassert the fact that there are actually alternatives out there. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that's a really important point about narratives. If we can get people to think in a different way, it changes culture and it can change structures eventually. And so that's, that's a really important point. But let's get into maybe, you know, one of the areas which you're really concerned on, and that's with the growth of big data. Some communities could be left out from the benefits and then that becomes a downsize as well. And you're very concerned, aren't you, about that in terms of marginalized communities and your data justice um, site is really set up to tackle some of those problems. Yeah, I think um, it, it, it happens in, in several different ways. So one thing why I'm, I'm particularly looking at this, uh, these developments from the perspective of marginalized groups, if you like, is because first of all, that's where a lot of experimentation takes place around how these uh, data can be collected uh, and used. And we see that, for example, with something like refugee populations who are who have lots and lots of very invasive data collected on them for in many ways they have no choice but to hand over um, biometric data so fingerprinting and, and so forth and that's then in turn used to create huge databases um, that then you know is used to make decisions about where they can and cannot go um, and I think that there we have an asymmetry simply in terms of how some populations are much more monitored th than others. So even though we all live in digital environments, if you like, I think we need to hold on to and remember that we're not all equally implicated. So that's uh, at, at one level. The other thing, of course, is that research has shown that in many cases when we start or in certainly in very important cases where we start making decisions off the back of mass data collection, we often data that very much in things like using um, data for uh, policing so data driven policing where in many cases we have had practices within policing that have meant that certain uh, groups in our society have um, been arrested more or been monitored more uh, by police and when you start then using that data to say well where is crime likely to happen or who is likely to become a criminal it this can become quite discriminatory because factors to do uh, not necessarily with whether someone will become a criminal or not but maybe more to do with what neighborhood they live in or what ethnic background they have there, that will be somehow determining whether their profile is someone who's likely to commit a crime. So there are issues around using data for decision making this way to do with the fact that um, it can lead to discriminatory outcomes, particularly against historically, you know, oppressed or, or marginalized groups in our society.
So it's almost like a discriminatory digital stop and search. That's how it's also been described. I mean, I think some of that came out in, in the Amnesty International reports on the gang matrix, for example, uh, which showcased um, that, um, that black boys particularly were being targeted uh, by, by those types of systems and databases. Okay, um, Terry? Um, I wonder if um, it's possible to be very easily very pessimistic about this. And I wonder if you can perhaps outline two scenarios, a pessimistic scenario of where this might all lead if adequate safeguards aren't in place. And then after that, perhaps a more optimistic um, scenario of how we can actually learn to live in, um, in, in, in an appropriate way with our own ability as a human race to gather huge data. Okay, that is a challenge. <laughs> well, I, I like asking challenging questions. Yeah, uh, I, it's also I will push back a little bit of the because I get asked this this um, a lot, and I have to say, as an academic, I, I find it sometimes a bit difficult to have to deal with uh, you know um, data for good versus data for bad as the as the binary in which we're supposed to understand this. And I say this uh, because. Um, we are dealing with a certain, we have a certain context in which this datafication, as we call it, you know, where more and more of our social life is being, being um, turned into data points that are then analyzed. Um, that this is happening in a particular context, and that context at the moment is that it's being predominantly driven by a few corporations. And so that's the, the situation that we're in. So we have to sort of deal with it on, on those terms, I think. So I think, of course, a huge uh, challenge that we face because of that is what power do we think that these types of corporations should have over our lives? And the problem with it is that they're taking on also what would be co traditionally considered governance functions. You know, so if we start sort of contracting corporations to provide um, systems to make decisions about us in, in key aspects of our lives, whether that's you know how we get hired for a job, or increasingly we have data-driven hiring processes, for example, um, or if it is whether we should go to prison or not, we have obviously a fundamentally unaccountable system and we also have you know, a, a completely different way of structuring our society where um, all of a sudden governance decisions are made by, not by governments that are democratically elected, but by corporations. Um, but I think in terms of, um, of sort of things that data can, can do, I mean, within this context, and that's really the only way that I can think about it, is that's the context we have. So what can data do in that context? Well, I think, you know, there are also ways in which we can use some of this kind of auditing that we have of data that have highlighted discriminatory effects to tell us something about society, you know, so we can use it to throw light on on various aspects of our society. So that's, um, that's one thing that it can do. And of course, there are also ways in which, you know, for example, civil society organizations use data to provide evidence for certain causes. Um, and data is very powerful in terms of, of uh, when you provide numbers, people tend to believe it more, right? So I think in that sense, you can also use it strategically, of course, to advance, uh, you know, agendas that are, are concerned with with social justice issues, and it can be very very useful um, for that. Um, isn't isn't one of the problems though the way that data digitally is weighted? If you have um, marginalised communities who don't have access to data uh, producing computers, um, iPads, and so on, that the data collected may reflect not a total community, but only a partial community. And therefore the needs of the community that are dispossessed digitally won't be in that data bank and won't be adequately, adequately analyzed. Yes, that's right. I mean, of course, that's, that's another way that data sets are skewed is by the lack of representation or silences in data sets uh, amongst certain communities. Um, and, and that's definitely uh, is, is an issue. Um, but in many cases, actually, you know, the marginalized groups are, are over, uh, they, they have more data collected on them than, than other groups rather than less data collected. But it's, it's another way in which bias might be, um, uh, might be produced through the you know, data-driven decision-making is, of course, also through the lack of, of um, certain types of data.
And what about the way services are delivered? I mean, do marginal, are you afraid sometimes that marginalized groups won't, through big data, get the right and adequate type of services that they need? I mean, yes, of course, but I'm not sure that that necessarily is a data issue. And that's, that's something that I think get lost when we focus on big data sometimes, is that we think that the reason that um, decisions are made or, or there's a lack of, of provision of certain services is because um, it's because of data. And of course, um, it's, it's to do with other factors as well. And as I mentioned, for example, in local government, many of these systems are introduced in a context of austerity. So you are trying to capture risk, but you have no resources to really act on that risk. So if you, for example, are profiling families to try and find out who might be vulnerable, but you actually have no reason or have no resources to engage with those families or to do any form of intervention, then of course that's not a data issue, it's a resource issue in public services. Okay, Terry? And you said um, a while back that if you provide numbers, people tend to believe it more. Mm -hmm. But is that the problem? is the problem that we actually expect numbers. Um, I mean, just to give you one very personal example, um, I was recently called into the doctor because of the age I am for, for test, and they said, you have a 16.4 chance of having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years. Uh, and my feeling was that that was actually fairly mathematically meaningless. Um, you know, was I meant to be grateful that I didn't have a 16.2%? And um, again, it's, it's, I suppose, I'm getting back to the idea of the conflation of data and reality. Have we all been conditioned by the big data industry to think um, uh, that as long as we can put a number on something, um, it's, it's, got a, it's got a reality? And uh, rather than... Uh, what, this is the, the, the question really, rather than worry about um, the implications of data for social justice, should we worry about the implications of data on understanding the world and understanding ourselves? Sure, I, I think that that is um, definitely uh, another thing. So this is this idea of, um, it, it is a particular, what we need to accept or at least um, make clear is that it's a particular way of understanding the social world. Right? It's a particular form of social knowledge uh, to start presenting, and it's also a particular way of understanding populations. So I think there's a fundamental question to be asked in terms of what happens when the way that un, uh, populations are understood is through data predominantly, um, because there are many ways in which, um, you know, the kind of... Um, the reason that some, some governments turn to data as a way of understanding populations arguably is because supposedly it uh, bypasses the need to listen to citizens because you can understand their needs simply by analyzing data about them. And so we have a fundamental question about what happens when we stop listening uh, to people and we start simply understanding them through these types of, um, of data points and, and various patterns and, and traits that we think um, will happen. So I think that is um, a key point. But also, I mean, we see, you know, there, there are scholars who have written about the culture that emerges with this emphasis on quantification also amongst, for example, if you look at social media, social media is entirely um, structured around a, a value placed on numbers. So how many friends or connections you had when something was published, how many likes, how many comments. I'm sure we'll measure the success of this on the basis of how many people and so forth, right? This is something that has fundamentally transformed our culture that we are um, adding, you know, putting so much emphasis uh, on numbers. Um, so yeah, that, that's also a, a Okay, you broke up at the, the end of that, but it's okay. Um, I mean, there's also the question of the misuse of information. I mean, Pil Peter Felton talked about, okay, people collect data when we buy something, you know, when we look at something, but then the misuse that he's worried about and other people are worried about is that it then gets sold on to people we don't know about. And is that one of the big problems of, of actually passing our information on to people that we did not give permission? For that information to be passed on to. Of course, I mean, if that was also the big case with Cambridge Analytica, for example, and what happened there is, is uh, that 
people were not aware that their data was going to be passed on and be used for political campaigning purposes. Um, so of course, this is um, this is a huge uh, uh, a huge risk that comes with uh, centralizing data into various different databases that can be easily passed on to others, easily shared, um, and who will then um, you know be able to to access that and use it. Um, particularly if we think about it in terms of you know which is where I think people are. are quite uncomfortable is the idea that lots of very, very personal and sensitive information uh, as, as this technology develops, there's an increasing emphasis on emotions, for example. So finding, I mean, you mentioned sentiment analysis, but we have more sort of sophisticated technology emerging to try and determine our emotional state. Um, and this is something that both Facebook, but also Amazon and other companies are, have patented uh, recently, for example, to try and invest more in, which tells us something about the direction of where these technologies are going. And there you have a big concern about how will our, you know, they're not necessarily our real emotion, but the way that our emotions are profiled be used to, for example, uh, target certain types of products to us so, and, and so forth. So if we're feeling depressed, et cetera, can that be used uh, to try and target us with certain products and things? And that I think is something that people probably find quite uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> and maybe we need to have some, uh, some regulation around, around the type of information that's allowed to be used. Well, some, I, oh. Oh, sorry, yeah, go on Terry. I was just going to say, just on that question of regulation, it made me uh, want to ask whether your work or the work of the Data Justice Lab has resulted in any specific recommendations to government about codes of ethics or legislatory or regulatory frameworks. Um, have, you, have you sort of got that far yet with the work? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky for us because we're, we're not uh, lawyers and so, yeah. but we do work with, uh, um, we do work, we were in a network obviously that includes also, also lawyers. I mean, actually that, although transparency is limited, one of the things that we have recommended, which um, we're not the only ones who recommended, was, was recommended to the Committee for Science, uh, the Science and Technology Committee as well, was to, um, for the government to provide actually a list over where in local and central government is data a data driven decision making or or data systems of some for data analytics being used to make decisions um just because at the moment and this is one of the challenges that we found looking at local authorities and councils is there's no systematic review uh, of what is actually happening and one local authority doesn't know what the other local authority is doing and central government doesn't know what local authorities are doing and i think um some kind of overview of what is actually happening and in what sectors and so forth uh, would be a good good starting point. So that's been one of one of our recommendations around this. But I do think also one of the you mentioned this idea of of establishing code of ethics. I just want to say that that's one of the things that I think we are obviously sympathetic to it, to the idea that we should have a discussion around ethics on this. But we're also very much pointing to the fact that you know we don't actually want. Um, these decisions to rely on ethical reflections. It should be there should be stronger regulatory frameworks in place um, beyond ethics, you know. And I think the reason that we're quite um, keen to make that point is because we, we what we're seeing at the moment is quite an industry-driven debate on ethics, where they're quite keen to keep. Uh, the discussion within or confined to a discussion on, on ethics as a way to avoid regulation. And that's something that we're quite um, alert to. I mean, it, ethics, having a code of ethics is what businesses would like because it's like having a voluntary code, isn't it? And they feel quite happy with that because it's not very, it's not very enforceable. But is it possible to have an ethical approach? I mean, it's incredibly difficult anyhow, isn't it? How do you have an ethical approach that everyone would come on board with that encompasses social inclusion and basic freedoms? Mm. Well, I do think that you can, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about um, also within the Data Justice Lab, that uh, at the moment we're having uh, a sort of guidelines around ethics that are to do with mainly sort of the nature of the technology itself. So, what, you know, that you need to sort of consider the type of data you're collecting, how invasive it is, and, and so forth. But what we feel perhaps we need to have more of is some kind of impact assessment as well, where you actually uh, engage with uh, impacted communities and find out how is this changing your lives, right? Because, uh, and that's something that, that we have much uh, less of. Um, but of course, I mean, I don't think you can have a universal code of it. 
impact on this. And I think it needs to be contextual because the issues will be different when you're talking about health or if you're talking about education, if you're talking about policing and so forth. So it needs to be uh, contextually understood what the ethical issues are. We can't have just one ethics guide. But the other development that I think is quite interesting that tells us something about the fact that um, there might be things changing around this is, of course, that these technology companies themselves are being confronted with their own employees actually saying, we don't want to be developing certain types of technologies. So what's been happening in Silicon Valley over the last year or so in particular is that we've had employees simply saying to Google or, and Microsoft, and now also there's a movement also within uh, Palantir to actually um, say, we don't want to be developing, for example, facial recognition technology that we think will be used in quite punitive ways uh, by government against certain populations. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned government. David Newman's just come up with the point. I mean, we're talking about big organizations, corporations, but you know, governments are now learning how to use and misuse big data. And what do we do about that? Do we have some sort of, you know, Bretton's Woods international agreement on big data? How do we actually tackle the misuse of big data by, by governments? I mean, we, we look at China and Russia, but I'm sure the US is doing it. I'm sure Britain is doing it. I'm sure they're all doing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the UK, of course, in Britain, they're, they're, they're trying to set up a number of different, you know, types of oversight bodies like the Council for Data Ethics and and the Alan Turing Institute is supposed to have uh, at least some input uh, in this. So there's a recognition that that uh, users need to be um, have oversight, proper oversight. And I think in terms of sort of looking at a kind of it probably because the data market is global, it probably does need to to does require some global agreements. But I I mean this is not an area in terms of intergovernmental agreements and what will be the nature of those is not something. Um, that I know is, is happening at the moment. Um, and I think it will be very difficult to, uh, to enforce. I, um, I recognize that, but I think it's, it's something that needs to, be, needs to be discussed. I mean, we just had, where the Data Justice Lab will have just worked with the um, UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, who was, uh, just did an investigation into the UK in terms of the effects of austerity. And one of the areas he was interested in looking at was the use of uh, digital technologies and algorithmic processes in welfare provision. And so he came to visit us um, to talk about that with us as part of his investigation. Um, and that's something that uh, he did because it is, there are similar developments happening in the United States uh, and elsewhere. So of course there are some global trends happening around this, which means that we, we, knew, we do need to have a global dialogue about what we think is appropriate. Okay, Terry. Um, um, start with an observation. I think a personal observation. I think the, the takeaway that I will have um, from this evening, certainly so far, is your statement that data can bypass the need for governments to listen to citizens. I mean, that's something I'm really going to mull over. And um, I'd like you to sort of maybe say just a little bit more about that. But if I can put in just one personal story, I take you to think I was somebody who goes to the doctor all the time. But once when I went to the doctor, um, I happened to mention a particular symptom. And then the doctor proceeded to have a conversation, not with me, but with her computer screen. And it, well, I was so struck by the fact that she was so um, concerned with the requirement that she have certain questions answered that she didn't even look at me. And I wonder if you can say anything about uh, what some people might regard as the dehumanizing effect, that the fact that there will be fewer conversations are, as a result of data. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, so this is something, of course, that, um, that we're also seeing, which, which means that these questions are not just about how effective these systems are, but are about people. So, you know, is it because a lot of people will say, well, humans are also biased and make wrong decisions and, and so forth. So what difference does it make that it's a computer? Well, there you, you point to, to something else that we do need to reckon with, which is the fact that 
people do feel differently having to engage with a computerized system than they do with, with humans, in part because at least humans can explain their decisions. And in many cases with big data and machine learning, uh, it is, a, you know, they can't. And so, you know, we have inexplainable uh, decision-making processes in place, which is a fundamental democratic issue as well. Um, but the, the dehumanizing fact, yeah, I do think, so for example, when we looked at um, this idea of using um, risk scores, for example, for young people in order to determine the, the likelihood of, of or the vulnerability or the likelihood of them, you know, being exploited in, in one way or another. And what happens then for social workers in terms of how they have to change their work. And there, I think there is a real concern also among social workers that if you are given a, a risk score in order to understand a family, rather than engaging with that in a family, understanding that contextual knowledge around um, lots of different uh, types of information that probably can't be captured uh, within a risk score, um, then you have a very, very different way of engaging with uh, your clients and with service users. And that is actually something that I think they're also concerned about, that this will bypass this more, um, you know, richer kind of relation that you have with, with families. Um, and and that the, one of the questions, of course, that we have to think about is, how empowered, because at the moment, nothing is actually, we don't have automated decision making in public services in the UK. What we have is the creation of these data systems that is, are, are used to help inform decision making. So there's still an onus on professional judgment. There's still an onus on that uh, the frontline, frontline staff still need to be able to make their own decisions about things and so forth. Um, but of course, if you are a social worker and you're provided with a risk score, um, the way in which you feel that you can either resist or bypass or not use that to make to inform your decision will be have to do with how you how empowered you feel as a professional, of course. And so th these are again lots of other types of social questions really that will be part of how this data comes to impact our lives. You know, we can't really understand these issues just looking at, at data questions. And I think this, this relates to a question that David Newman has just asked. He says, in public consultation, officials set out to learn from the experiences and values and values of citizens. How can big data find values or abstract individual experiences? And is there a danger that um, we can get confused between the citizen as a service user or as the owners of of the government in a sense, the people who should be, um, to whom the government should be answerable. I mean, it does seem to me that uh, it can turn the relationship upside down, or yeah, there's a danger of it. I think it can, and but but of course, if you speak to people who are, so the, we, I've done research with people who are developing these systems, and of course, I think their, their intentions are, you know, I think they're aware of some of these types of concerns, but of course, what they feel is that they're developing systems that are, are designed to help frontline staff get a better understanding um, of families. But I think, so the question is, well, what will be the balance between, or what will be the way, um, the relationship between data-driven you know, analysis and people's own judgment. And that's going to be to do with all kinds of other political and social questions. Um, so the extent to which this is only ever data informed decision or data driven decision making, right? These, these, this will be the key uh, issue of contention, I think. Okay, they, let's take up this human value thing again, because it's quite interesting. I mean, today we're in the age of identity politics. I mean, the view that Hegel had that we seek recognition after our basic needs is now here with us with a vengeance. Um, you know, people want to be valued and they're worried about not being valued and they're looking at identities and people are having multi, multiple identities. Politics is centered around this agglomeration of identities. Now, the problem with big data for people is they feel that they're not valued any longer. They're being analyzed without knowing about it. Data is being used without knowing about it. They're being provided services rather than voting for. They are actually being provided by some sort of technocratic elite. And there could be a reaction. I mean, somebody said, wherever there is identity politics, there is always the growth of populism. And data could get you know, could meet itself coming back. There could be a political reaction because it dehumans people, it doesn't value people, and it challenges their identity. 
Mm. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a discussion um, in data now to do with, so because recognition is also a key social justice concern, right? So, um, uh, you know, this is where um, this is a, a key um, way in which people feel that they can participate in social life is and, and in society is also by being fully recognized and increasingly we are recognized through algorithms or algorithmic processes and um, and one of the issues with it is precisely also that it tends to reduce identity. Um, so there's a kind of reductionism because you have to fit into a certain category uh, when you're being um, when your identity or, or the way that you're being recognized happens through data-driven systems. So I do think, of course, there's a danger that um, these systems can't, uh, again, comes down to the fact that they can't cope with the complexities of our identities very well. This comes out in things like gender, for example. Um, so, you know, if you look at something like airport security systems, um, where you have to go through the body scanner. The body scanner only accepts male and female gender, for example. So if you're a transgender dry, uh, traveling and you go through an airport scanner, you are very likely to be uh, signaled as a risk because um, the way that your body is being monitored by these systems can't decide whether, so, whether, so the, the security guard has to decide whether you're male or female, but your body features won't fit either. And so you get highlighted as a risk, right? Because these systems can't account for complex gender identities. This is just an example to illustrate a broader point about how categories can be quite violent and oppressive uh, sometimes in terms of uh, if they get used in these very reduced ways. Okay, well, we're coming close to the end, I think. So, I mean, Terry, would you like to ask one final question and then I'll ask one and then we'll conclude. Okay, yes. Well, I never like to leave an interview go by without asking a question about reductionism. And you, you prompted that by, uh, by mentioning that word. It's, uh, I wonder if you could comment on this. I wonder if there's a danger that um, really over the last 50 years, science has become um, interested in complexity, in the idea that the important things that happen can't be understood by reducing a system to its component parts and measuring them. And is there a conflict between um, scientists' understanding of system thinking and complexity on the one hand, and the fact that um, a measurement obsession, if I can you put it like that, encourages us to have a reductionist view of the universe. There certainly is, are people who understand datafication as a rationalization process in that it's a sort of return to quite a positivistic understanding of science, meaning that it is possible to, for example, um, analyze human behavior with the view to predict events and occurrences and so forth. Uh, which is, um, you know, something that we were familiar with in the sort of 1950s and, and that kind of era of, of uh, politics and, and science. And there are certainly some people who understand that what's happening with, with the advent of big data and how it's, um, and, and the value that we attribute to it is because of a sort of reintroduction of these kinds of very rationalist understandings of, of the world. So I definitely think that there is uh, some, some tension here with that. Okay, well, we're sort of coming to the end. Let me ask you, I mean, if people wanted to know more about this, because for a lot of people, a lot of these issues are probably quite new and they're only thinking about it because it's only hit us in the last few years how, um, you know, how this seeps through all of society. If they wanted to find out more about it, where would they find out? Would they go to your data justice lab, for example? What would they find there? What else could they do to find out? How could they carry on this conversation? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's quite a lot of, of um, material out there now, I think, that, that talks about this. Um, of course, the work that we do at the, at the Data Justice Lab, we try and, and produce uh, reports. If people are interested to think about harms and how particularly marginalized groups are, are being impacted, then I would recommend, you know, we have on a Data Justice that website, uh, what we call a data harm record, where we provide illustrative and concrete examples, uh, written by my colleague Joanna Redden, where there's concrete examples, very, you know, very clear, clear language that explains the way in which data-driven decision-making can have potential of course, I can I can advertise my own book. I just have a new book out uh, called Digital Citizenship in a Datafied Society. And there we're trying to actually um, re, you know, reevaluate 
what does citizenship mean in a datafied society where our digital technologies are not just used for enhancing our ability to influence decision making, but is also actually making us citizens through the tracking, profiling and categorization that happens when we engage with digital uh, environments. But other than that, I mean, there are, there are, I would also, by the way, just if, I mean, this is a US based organization, but there's an organization called Data and Society in which based in New York, which has a huge amount of resources um, are dealing with lots of these different issues, including questions around what it does to our understanding of knowledge and other types of things like that. So I would recommend uh, people to, to go there as well. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And anyhow, if you can advertise your own book and your own webinar, what can you do? <laughs> um, what we'll do is we'll make sure we send a link to your book out to, uh, when we send the webinar out and let people know about it. And yeah, thanks for doing this because it's been incredibly fascinating. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of areas we could have explored further and I hope maybe we can do another webinar with you sometime next year on specifically local government and big data. And we'll try and do it in the daytime and get some local government people in the audience as well. And um, because I think that would be great to do. So thank you for doing this. Um, thank you, Terry, for helping as well. That's been great. And your questions, you know, have been, you know, important and added in another dimension. So thank you. And um, we hope, you know, you'll do this again. And so we'll uh, finish this webinar now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.